So this is uh, Lessons from Learning Leaders. I'm Dwayne Lester, and this is the first podcast I'm doing without my good friend, Bob Pike, who passed away recently. And I've been thinking a lot about Bob recently, and I actually thought about him today when I was at the gym. I have this this uh, music that I listen to, and it kind of motivates me, and it gets me psyched up. And when I listen to it, a lot of times at, at the gym, I'm like, when I get home, I'm doing this about training and this about training. And so I was going through that in my mind tonight. I was going to do this, and then I'm going to call Bob, and, and I'm not. I'm not going to call Bob. And oh. that uh, that hurt. I mean, when that happened, that that hurt. But I was thinking about him and what the biggest lesson he ever taught me. Because, you know, we spent five years. Well, that Bob and I, we spent well since 2018 talking yeah. and, um, you know, we'd go to the training magazine and we'd have dinner with him almost every time. I think, yeah. I think you, uh, the year you went, the first year we all went out to dinner and it was at the buffet, right? It, it was, it was at the buffet. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. It was, yeah. uh, so many, so many conversations, so many dinners, yeah. um, so many questions. I asked him, but I thought about what's the biggest lesson he ever taught me. And I wrote about that and I put it on the sub stack uh, this morning and I hope everyone gets a chance to go read it. Uh, but I'm curious, Jason, um, what are, what are the lessons that Bob taught you? Is there one that sticks out that you think back and think that that was a game changer for me? Uh, Dwayne, there's too many. Um, well, I first met Bob in summer of 2018 when you brought him to my organization to, to teach our entire department. And then I got, I got the privilege of doing the three day course of his in 2019. Um, I have been training for eight years at that point, And I walked out of a three day training with Bob completely changed. He changed how I look at training completely. Um, on any given day, there's a different thing I learned the most from him. Uh, like, only an hour ago, an hour before this recording, I was coaching hockey. And one of the teams I coach is a bunch of eight and nine year olds. And one of the things Bob taught us was the phrase, in just a moment. And that captures people's attention. And I truly love the in just a moment because you have three or four things that we have to give when we're driving people into breakout groups or we're giving instructions. And people have the tendency to kind of stop listening as soon as you say in your groups, or in this case on the ice, everybody go to your spot. People stop listening and they don't hear the final mm -hmm. instruction. So I've really taken to it. And just this evening with a bunch of eight and nine year olds on ice, I said, in just a moment, you're going to go to your spots. And I actually paused for a second and was like, yep. And then I told them <laughs> the instruction for the drill we were working on. And then I said, now go to your spots. Um, and it's become so ingrained and so natural that I forget I say it. So I knew we were doing this and that just kind of came in. So I think that's what kind of spurred me to kind of pause for that half a second. Well, I appreciate you taking the time mm -hmm. to talk with me. And uh, I know you well, but a lot of people watching don't know you well. So please mm -hmm. uh, tell me, tell me your story going all the way back to when you first got into the training industry. Yeah. When I first got in the training industry was actually as a volunteer fire captain on my local fire department. I've been on the department for about 10 years. This is 2003 when I first joined and I started helping out. You know, I've always been able to speak to people, been able to convey information. And so they just kind of put me in this role to train our new firefighters. Um, by so that common. Time, so mm -hmm. common that somebody's so really good at something and they say, mm -hmm. well, if you're good at it, obviously you can train it. Right. And right. They, you find yourself in that training right. position. Exactly. And, and I jumped on it because at that point I was married. I had one son at that time um, so far at that point. And I said, I said to myself, these are the guys that are going to save my life if something goes wrong. I need them to be the best they can possibly be. And if I can play a role in that, great. So that, that was the attitude that I took. Now I'm a big guy. I'm 6'2". I am broad-shouldered and, well, broad-bellied. We'll take it that way. Um, and so some of the trainings were, you need to pull me 
this length, not the smallest member on the department. So I'm putting myself out there for this. Um, and it was important. And I learned all these lessons and I started trying to do my best and imparting that and got into training the medicine side as well. I became an EMT, became a paramedic, ended up supervising ambulances in three different states. And then I joined a, a, a national network of nonprofits. It's it's kind of been an amazing five-year journey in that and became a full-time trainer and traveled the country. And now I get to empower people all over that want to do better, want to make the world a better place. And I get this little privilege of coming in here and there and kind of just helping them along in their journey. And it's but you, great. You still do a lot of training back home though, right? It's not just all on the road. I do. I do. Um, I continue to uh, keep up with the fire department and with the ambulances as well. I truly love it. It's fun. We are now um, just about a year ago, I had an incident where someone who was training new EMTs, I happened to just pass through and he said, oh, that's Jason. Jason taught me everything I know. And I'm like, oh, I remember saying that. How long have I been doing this? Oh, no. Like My first realization was horror. And then I stood back and I watched and he was not only teaching like the perspectives and the mental models and, and the how to approach a patient, but he was also teaching the new techniques that we all study on stuff that I never taught him that I had to go learn that we then learned together and new medical techniques and new medical work. And he had taken up this mantle and it was amazing. Now, as you can tell by the beard, for those that may have worked in public safety, I am no longer a firefighter. Um, I'm no longer active on an ambulance. Uh, I still hold my paramedic license. That was two years of full-time school. I am not willing to give up. Uh, maybe someday again, but my life has led me right now to not be active on those. Um, but I'm still taking those trainings and the lessons that I learn and everything with me every day and figuring out where, I, where and how I can use them for good. So the training that you give... Mm -hmm is often very top down. It's stuff mm -hmm. that is created somewhere mm -hmm. else and given to you. And then you have to go and present this. And often it isn't really instructor led participant centered, it's is not. it? It's very much centered on the content. Am I, yes. am I wrong there? No, you nailed it. Um, you know, your OSHA stuff, your um, state EMS or fire boards, they're not written for trainers. They're not written by trainers. They're not written by people who keep active in this because it's not their role. They see mistakes being made and they say, we need a training on this. They see new updates in medicine and they say, these are the things that need to be put in front of people. And these are the things they need to learn. Um, so a lot of folks are pretty good at learning objectives. And sometimes it's yearly stuff. So those kind of low frequency, high impact things that you may not deal with every day, but when you deal with it, you need to be perfect or things that you do do every day that you need to train on over and over again. And they can come out in a very dry, tough manner that everybody hates the yearly training on X and the yearly training on Y. And it's been 20 years and you're like, I've done this training 21 times and I don't want to do it again. And it just leads to this negative experience all around. So you don't want to go to new trainings even. And you don't want to go to any kind of training because in your mind is all these mandated things where the state hands down slides that are just covered in words and it's click through and we're all like, oh, well, I guess we're going to suffer together and we're, we're forced to do this. And it, it makes this bad environment where now you're not taking the training home and you're not taking the valuable tip at home. And that that's tough. So what do you do in order to make that training stick? I mean, you're talking about some very boring, sit and get, mm -hmm. hypnotic, slide inducing sort <laughs> of uh, training. Yep. What do you What do you do now yep. to make this a better experience for the people in the room? So I actually have six things, and sometimes you can do all six and really dive into them, and sometimes you may only be able to do one really well, and the rest is static. Um, let's see if we have time to go through all six. Um, but I think, and these are all things that I've learned throughout the years. Bob played a big hand in a lot of these. I know I can't take credit for them. All I did was kind of coalesce them around mandated trainings. 
um, the first thing that you do is kind of accept the truth. Um, you know, it's not about us, but when we walk in, we have to have that credibility. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm fortunate that I got to work with a lot of people who were the best in their field. So frequently we may not be the expert in this, but we are expected to facilitate this conversation and, and have people come out with, with the best result. We may not have been working on that piece of equipment for 20 years, but we have to give that safety training. Um, and so they aren't the best sometimes, but we have to accept this truth and saying anything else will set you up for failure. So coming in and saying, all right, this is what I have to do. They told me I have to show these slides and they even said each slide has to be up for a minimum of one minute and I have to repeat the words on the slide because that's mandated. And yes, I've received those trainings that have said it. I'm not making that up. Um, so we're going to work in that boundary and being honest with people and saying, hey, we know how this is, but it's required. There are things I can do to make this a better experience. And there are ways that we can work together. So when we finish this, we don't feel it's a wasted day. And how is that yeah. taken when you when you sit there and say, look, I know what this is like. I've sat where you sat are sitting right now. This is the reality of this situation. How does, how does the class respond to that? The first time I did it, um, the old grizzled guy in the back just shouted, I'm going to back away from my mic. Thank you. <laughs> um, I've been in the class where the guy goes, we're going to have fun today and this is great. And this is a wonderful training and I'm so excited to give it. And I'm just thinking, I don't believe you. And he might've been telling the truth, but we are all so jaded these days. It feels like, I don't believe you. Yeah, but right. that You're guy not the... fooling anyone. Exactly. You're not fooling <laughs> anyone. But that guy in the back, he could have been someone who was adversarial all day. Mm -hmm. He may not have wanted to be there. He definitely didn't want to be there. He could have been someone who was talking on his phone in the back all day, but I stood up and I said, there are things I can control in this environment. We can have a good time and get through this. And I understand the, 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 the what we're going through. And he heard it, he respected it, and he became an ally for me in that training. That's really respecting their experience too. It is. Because you, you, we, we talk about human or not human action model. That's something different. <laughs> but we talk about, uh, you know, adult learning theory and uh, respecting and recognizing the experience of yes. the learners in the room. I yep. think saying to them, you've, we've seen this. You've seen mm -hmm. this. I've seen this. We know what this is like. Mm -hmm. This is the way it has to be, but we can do other things. Mm -hmm. It shows a lot of respect for them. It does. And I think that, that respect translates into some other things. Um, I love having the table groups, you know, round tables are amazing. Chevrons, if I don't have that or, and anything other than just a line of chairs with no tables. What, what do you mean by chevrons? That's a great one. That's a great question. I appreciate you making me circle back on that. So, you know, round tables where you've got four people at the table. So everyone's kind of facing forward, but multiple tables where people can sit together. If I don't have that table set up, I'll take the regular four by eight foot rectangle table and I'll make it look like just a military rank chevron and it'll all kind of be folded into the center at about a 45 at most degree angle and at the long side of the table you have two people in the middle and then you have two people on either end you can sometimes do four or three however you need to be but you're still putting four people no one has the back to the front of the room and everybody can talk to each other at tables that's the goal is that I want them talking to each other to have that discussion. And one one of the other things that's great about chevrons is not only can they see each other at the table, but you still have sight lines generally to the other tables. When they're yes. talking about whatever they discussed, the other tables still have a good line of sight to them. Right. That way you don't have to fully kind of turn your whole body around and do all that to go see someone. You have that full access to everyone in the room and the full access to the entire table. It's, it's, a, it's a good setup. Um, those rectangle tables, I get it. They're easy to store. They're a great price. Everyone has them. Use a Chevron, and it, it helps bring people together. In that same, I like to mix up who's at tables together, especially if I have multiple departments or multiple shifts. Uh, people tend to kind of stick together. Or if I have a bunch of newbies, they're all kind of like sitting in the back, or they're maybe sitting in the front, and then all the people of 20 years are sitting in the back. 
Um, if it's a group that I'm able to build that trust with quickly, um, or if I really want to make, really want to get them out of the comfort zone and push, I love doing the human lineup. And I make people line up by how much their experience is and how long they've been in the field. This helps the new people see who some of the most senior people are. This helps the most senior people and it acknowledges their seniority. So I line them up by rank. There's activities you can do around that. Um, but that first part is that acknowledges the experience in the room. You know, when I say down to the end and someone goes, I've been doing this for 35 years, like the people in the middle are all like kind of start clapping every now and then. I'm like, this is, this is great. This is a wealth of knowledge. This is an important person to have here. And then I'll organize the tables. If I have six tables, you count off one through six. So that newest person, the person that's, this is my first time here is going to be at a table with that person that's been doing it for decades and they can get to know each other. And I tell people, as you're going to your tables, I expect you to introduce yourselves to each other. The new people that are here, these are people that you're going to lean on outside of this. You're going to see them. You're going to see them on other shifts. When you put overtime in other shifts, if this is all with one department, you're going to see each other, get to know each other. So you're not blindly meeting each other on your, on your first day. Um, that respects them again. And then um, I'm going to pick on myself. I'm a storyteller. And that comes to, we have a term uh, in EMS. And um, I've been told the military folks use it as well. Fire uses it. Police use it. War stories. The person who just wants to go over that one time that happened to me or, oh, you did that? Well, let me tell you when something similar happened, but my story's cooler. I, I'm guilty of it. We're all guilty of it. Some of us are more guilty than others. That can so let me tell you about the time I did that, but it was <laughs> much cooler. It was much cooler when you did it. Yes, of course, of course. And also when a third screen pops in and someone else tells me a story. Right. <laughs> These usually have a point and they highlight, they're, they're brought up because they highlight what we're talking about. But if I have six people who want to do that, all of a sudden this training goes an extra hour because I'm mandated to state a certain amount of things and train a certain amount of things. So the training goes long and makes it even worse. So by splitting them into groups, when someone starts to war story, I say, wait, hold on. Share it with your group. I want everybody who has a similar story and say, who has a similar story? And like someone from every table will raise their hands and I'll say, let's really quick, two minutes. I want you to tell the table that story. And I want one of the new people to share that story back to me. I want some, or I want someone that's new to tell me important, something in that story that tied back to what we're talking about. Now, all of a sudden, all six war stories get told and it's done in a positive way. I don't want to shut them down. I don't want to disrespect them. But that war story now turns into a training, now turns into learning, and it turns into building connections and trust. So how often do you speak with the uh, the vets before the training begins? <laughs> how often do you, I mean, I, I assume you know, you see these people every time mm -hmm. you're there, you oh, know yeah. who they are, you know how long they've been there. Do you ever pull them aside before training starts and say, listen, this is what we're going to do, and I need your help? Yes. Yes. Um, that is one thing I don't do as much as I should, but yes, absolutely. There's plenty of times I've seen people, um, if I see a chief, there's a couple chiefs that I'm really good connected with. And I'm like, you know, your guys lead, you lead your guys. Um, if you're disengaging on your phone, they're disengaging on their phones and you're going to be really mad. You're paying overtime for this. If you're engaged and you're talking, your folks are going to do better. And I apologize. I say, guys, I, I'm sorry. You know, like um, that's something I've got to work on. But the folks in the room, they follow you. And so they're going to do what you do. Um, and so I, sometimes I'll try to find the most senior person in the room and go, Lieutenant, they're going to do what you do. If you're disengaged, they're disengaged. Or I'll, uh, more frequently it happens at a break. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll approach someone individually and say like, hey, I need your help. So yeah. the first thing you do, looking back on it, the first thing you do is recognize the reality of the situation. Mm -hmm. We all know uh, this is, we've all seen this. We all know what this is going to be like. There is a, an element of awfulness to what we're all about to experience. This mm -hmm. is the reality of the situation. Yep. The second thing is to break people up by experience um, and 
put them at their own tables so you have people with more experience working with those who have less. And again, going back to adult learning theory, leveraging the experience that's in the room to enhance the training and actually get them more involved. Exactly. Yes. Yep. So what's number three? Number three is I dive in to the real meaning of the training. I'm a big fan of the phrase, at the end of this training, participants will. Now, as a trainer, every time someone asks me to come out to them, in that conversation, I ask that question. At the end of this training, participants will. And it's gotten to a point where some of the folks that bring me out regularly, they already have it ready. So have that phrase. So when I understand that phrase, I can understand what they want from us, why this mandated training exists. Um, I've had mandated trainings come down because suddenly everyone's making a mistake and now the state decides everyone has to take this training to fix this mistake. Or it's a yearly update. Okay, at the end of this training, participants will draw up diabetic medications better and able to inject it correctly. Great. I know now I have things I have to do, but I really need to focus on ensuring they know that process and they know the steps to deliver this medication correctly. That's why we're here. And then with that, I have to understand my parameters. There may be a test, specific data points, slides that were required, um, all of that. So that compliance isn't thought with training around it. So when I understand my parameters, I can then build in the strategic activities and breaks that come with it. If they require things to be done in a certain order and they say you can take two 15 minute breaks, I get to pick where those breaks are. So I may kind of have it floating a little. Or if they say, here's something that to hand out, great, I'm gonna hand it out to the tables. I'm gonna have each table read it to each other just so they don't hear just me the whole time. So if it's something to read, you're gonna read the handout at your table and then you're gonna discuss it. And each table is gonna come up with one question for me from the handout that we have from the state. One thing you need clarified from this. And now we know we have six questions and we can tick those things off. What kind of feedback have you gotten when you ask at the end of this participants will? Uh, the most common feedback is, uh, good question, which is normal. That's fine. That's absolutely fine. And then we're going to dive into it. Um, do, you, do you get a lot of people who will respond with, well, they'll know this? Yes. Um, how, do you, how do you handle that? So I ask them, I kind of dive into deeper and deeper questions because what I'm looking for is that action. And what I'm looking for, for me, is, is training the answer. Sometimes we default to training because we think it's a training. You know, there's the, if their life depended on it, could they do this? Well, depending on how the answer is a very different question about training. Um, and when I ask that question, I'm looking for what's the action I expect them to take. They're going to do better at this skill. They're going to use this new safety implementation all the time. At the end of this training, when we got new power stretchers, so stretchers that actually you don't have to manually lift a patient, they're battery powered, they can move up and down. They're amazing. Um, they really do extend careers. Sorry, that was a, but the point of that is at the end of that stretcher training, we expected people to use them injury free. At the end of that training, we expected batteries to be charged at the end of a shift. And at the end of that training, we expected people to properly use it. And in six months, uh, workman's comp train, uh, events, from back injuries, plummeted 95%. So that's I, the result. I was laughing earlier because when you talked about battery-powered stretchers, you don't have to lift them. I instantly heard that 35-year grizzled vet who's like, well, battery? What? You, you, know, you know, he's like, you all are soft. Back in my day, we didn't even have stretchers. We had to build them on the scene, and we liked it. 
I was very fortunate that my 35 year old grizzled veteran walked by and went, you mean the new guy's not going to break my back? All right, let's do this. Nice. So right then, but that I didn't realize it then, but thinking back, that was buy-in. If he's in, everybody better be in or you're in trouble. I think I think yeah. another reason you ask, what is it they will do at mm-hmm. the end of this? And I think that's key. What is it they will do? And again, we go back to, to what Bob taught us. Mm-hmm. Training is about performance improvement. It's not yes. about knowledge. When someone, I'd say, what well, what is it they will do at the end of this? Well, they'll know this. I would say, well, why? Mm-hmm. Why do they need to know that? Well, so they could do this. Okay, so that's what we're after. That's the we're training. after them doing this action later on. Mm-hmm. So, so let's focus on that. And I think that's that's a key question to ask because if it's just a transfer of knowledge, it's, you send them an email. Yep. And in this case, I'm asking myself that. And when I receive a training from the state or from the head of the training, or when I'm told I want them, the chief says I want them to do that, then I'm asking that question. So I'm asking it myself. I've emailed people back, uh, state training officers, and said, hey, can you help me out? I'm trying to figure after this training, what's the action you want them to take? Or or how does this look on their day to day? And I'll get a great answer. I'm like, okay, now I'm clicked in. Uh, Very cool. So there's four. (laughs) Is that four or is that three? The the, the true meaning and the parameters I always break apart because I want to take that time to say at the end of the training participants well. Then I want to look at the parameters around the training and I want to separate those to give them their individual time because then I'm building the event. You know, I'm a firm believer training is a process. It's not just an event, but we have that moment in the training. So I want to understand that and build out the hour, two hours, four hours I have with people. Excellent. What's number five? Number five is, this is, this one's my favorite, is creating the environment and engaging the senses. And this is my favorite because I started doing it last. And I think it actually was the 2020 training conference that I really started to dive into this and think about it. But. (laughs) When we want to engage all of our senses, we're talking coffee, water, snacks. When you walk into a room and it smells stale, dry, it feels like you're the fifth class in there, you're signing everybody up for a terrible day. Do you use the scented markers? I love the scented markers. Whenever I can at a table, I'll use the scented markers. Brings people back to childhood. Yeah, um, I always, I always will bring, I use those again. That's something I learned from Bob, yep. but a lot of people won't notice them right away. They're not expecting them. Nope. And then I'll say, you know, at the end of this training, I'm going to want to know which is your favorite smelling markers. Yep. Enjoy them. These are the, and this always gets a laugh. These are the one markers probably in the room that you can huff and it's fine. You're still going <laughs> to learn something. Yep. Yep. I, I, you know, I should say that at an ambulance. This is the only thing in the building you can huff. Um, <laughs> But walking in, and Bob was really good about making like there being quiet music in the background. So you were aware of music, but it wasn't overbearing. Mm-hmm. And then you walk in and you see on each table, there's sticky notes, there's markers, there's paper, there's pipe cleaners, there's do- stuff to doodle with. The room has been prepared for you to come in. And so that smelling coffee, even I know people who don't drink coffee, who love the smell of coffee. So coming in and having that, and then you look and there may be some snacks and there's some water bottles sitting there and there's a little sign that says, please feel free, take some. Um, Even if it's the end of the day, there are people that drink coffee 24 seven. I don't, but I still like the smell. So if I'm coming Mm -hmm. in in the evening, this just makes the environment better. You have music playing and all of a sudden you realize like, oh, this guy planned for me to be here. We aren't just being tossed into a room to go do the mandated thing and the doors are locking behind us until we suffer through enough. He planned for us to come in and do this training. And that can kind of start to relax people and build that trust. So before you ever get them to believe you in a human lineup, you've already fed them, gave them coffee, got them water, got them a good environment. Now they're more willing to trust you on the next crazy thing you ask of them. Because you're again, you're showing them respect. Exactly. 
Well, it really does come down to it. I, you can take every single one of these and bring that back to showing them the respect that they deserve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So one last one, number six. One last one. Let's take Handouts. it home. Handouts. So these are, you know, there may be safety updates, equipment changes, protocol changes, new rules. If you're just slogging through an hour at the end of a long week, you're not going to remember that as well. So when appropriate, and I know sometimes it's not appropriate, there may be um, a corporate rule, there could be some privacy, there could be a whole host of reasons, but having something tangible for somebody to take home changes how they approach everything and how they're able to have it. So if it's a safety thing and you're allowed to hang something up at a, an appropriate distance from a machine that's visible, then you can hang up, hey, new safety piece, new change, machine equipment change. So if it's 2 a.m., it's been three weeks, you're on third shift, it's the last night of four 10-hour shifts in a row, you can look up and see on that wall. Again, safe distance, everybody. Make sure you're complying with everything. But you can see that message that says, oh, new equipment rule, new, new piece of equipment that has this safety check. And I do that those kind of handouts with these things in mind. Um, one of my earliest trainings that I went to, um, it was all sorts of new little changes with medicine, like very rare medicines that we sometimes use, but when we need them, they need to be right because they have very specific doses. I got a little quarter sheet of paper that was laminated that talked about all of those medicines, and that still sits in the ambulance today. There's a new copy. But it still sits there because when I need it, I need it. Mm -hmm. And I'm the type going to an emergency that if I know I have to do the full paramedic everything, you know, I'm checking, I'm looking at my notes, what to expect, thinking about the medications. But in the back of an ambulance, I, I'm not going to take my phone out in the back of an ambulance. That's also contamination things. I don't want to be touching my phone three hours later. Um, I want that where I can get it and I can see it. So I take that. And that's what I do. Um, you taught me uh, regarding handouts. Oh boy, the idea of making them a trifold, turning yes. them into a, a trifold pamphlet—that's something that you mm -hmm. could stick in a pocket, it and is. it's there when you need it. And mm -hmm. you know, your handouts don't just have to be at one sheet of paper. Here's here's mm -hmm. a you know standard looking handout. You could make a trifold that you can manipulate and have the information wherever you want. That was a, a great tip that I used mm -hmm. in a training. What was it about a year ago? It was about a year ago, and, yeah. And people and so, love that. I say uh, when you fold in on that back, that's always going to be showing. These are your top things, your very, very top things, your your need to know stuff. On the inside, you can say you can have references because you're not going to look at the inside as much. So there's books, articles, uh, quotes, things to look at as reference when you have time. And then those two others on the outside that can fold in and out that's your your tier two important right so everything about this and everything about that so the individual has the option to put whatever is important on the outside for them that day you know i still carry look two in the morning um pumping technology on fire trucks there's a lot of math you know we're thinking gallons per minute on different diameter hoses that have different pressure requirements this is stuff that you may not use all the time but if you get it wrong you have four people or two people inside a building on fire without water that aren't coming home. So I need that math right. So I have laminated sheets in my gear that says this means this means this. And it has the math. It has the equations that I need. Now, I drill on this all the time. This is something we practice every time. But having that backup means that I'm just that little bit better. If there's somebody who's watching this podcast or listening to it and they want to get in touch with you to, mm -hmm. to work through some ideas on making their stale mandated training a little more interesting and palatable, where can they reach you? So I am on all the social medias as Jason S. Edson. Some are pretty eclectic as to what I post, um, but Twitter, or Instagram, two great places to reach out to me. Um, right now I'm writing all these down and formalizing them and giving them to you. So my hope is that, uh, very soon people will start to see this. Um, I believe I'm going to use the title guest writer or Dwayne's favorite guest writer, maybe something along those lines. Um, 
So the plan, you see me on this, uh, Dwayne folks can always reach out to you right into this podcast. You know, we talk every day. At, um, and it's, it's a wonderful part of my day that we get to talk every day. Oh, um, shucks. So reaching out to Dwayne is another great way to be able to connect to me. Well, Jason, thanks for taking the time to walk through this with us. And um, I, I have valued your friendship and your, honestly, a lot of your advice and guidance over the years. So thank you for doing this. Great six tips. And uh, this will not be the last time you're on the podcast. Guaranteed. Awesome. Can't wait. Have a great night. You too.